So I see there are not critical people here. Some of them are missing, so maybe it's too early. So anyhow, let us start, otherwise we will not be able to finish. So I am Shubhodit De, and I work here at IUPA. So I am an experimentalist. So my talk will be more very generalized things. I don't go into very deep into experiments and etc. because I think it's not really needed at this stage. But you will have a chance to visit our lab on Monday and Tuesday. So there are two days, there are slots where you can visit our lab. So if you have queries, etc., please feel free to ask us. And anyhow, I mean, you can ask during the talk, after the talk, during when you are visiting the lab. And even like I'm here. So if you think you are interested to anything more, just come to my office or something like that, you will be able to find me. So uh, feel free to ask, ask anything. Uh, okay, so uh, the topic what I'm going to cover, again, it doesn't work. It's not working. The topic that I'm going to, even it's not working. So the topic that I'm going to cover is practically atomic clocks. So how many of you thought of, I, I mean, I think all of you have heard atomic clocks, right? Am I correct that all of you have heard of atomic clocks? So please say yes, no, something otherwise I won't understand. So like, I don't know how much deeper you know. I don't expect you know that deeper because it's not the right age or you have not learned these things. So you, I have four lectures, uh, and in these four lectures, I have divided the topics in this way. Introduction to the atomic clocks. So today will be very short of, I mean, I will go into a little bit deeper also. Introduction to the atomic clocks. Second thing is optical atomic clock. Optical atomic clock is another category of the atomic clock. Atomic clocks uh, works in different uh, frequencies in microwave as well as and optical frequencies. And optical atomic clocks are the most precise one up to date today. Yeah. Then I will discuss mostly on this uh, third and fourth lecture about the application of the atomic. So can anyone say what, why do we need atomic? What is the purpose of having atomic clock? Anyone? You say. I mean, we get so that. You know, it's on the family. Okay, so sort of time synchronization. Yeah. yeah, so that's what we know. Like that is a very, I mean, right answer, of course. And since the instrument name has clock, we always think it's a clock. It's just a watch. It's a time uh, time keeping or time synchronization. But it's actually not. And that would be my focus during the applications part. That please make sure you understand this thing. That atomic clock is an instrument. The instrument name is clock, but time and frequency metrology or time keeping, time synchronization is only one application of that instrument. For example, the best atomic clock that we have in the world, it keeps time, it maintains time, it has a one second inaccuracy over 300 billion years. 300 billion years is much, much longer than age of the universe. So why do we need that kind of time? If it is only time synchronization or time keeping, nobody in the world needs that sort of activity. So from there, you should ask yourself then why people are making better and better atomic clocks. What is the need? If it is not needed for time synchronization, then why do we do that? The reason people are inclined to make better and better atomic clocks, even better than what I told you right now, because this instrument 
is one of the most accurate instrument other than LIGO, next to LIGO, to measure many fundamental aspects of science. Even it can detect gravitational waves, it can detect uh, dark energy, dark matter, it can test many fundamental science things, etc. So practically speaking, the instrument which is somehow named atomic clock is just a sensor. It's one of the most precise sensor. And that is the motivation that you want to make this sensor much, much more precise. You, have, you want to increase the accuracy of the instrument much, much better than what we have today so that you can capture this kind of fundamental science things. So from today onwards, please make sure you know that even the instrument name is atomic clock, time and frequency metrology is just one application of it. And by the way, when this atomic clock is used as a time and frequency metrology, time keeping or time synchronization, then this instrument name gets changed. Then we call it, any idea? We call it time and frequency standards. So this standard comes there. If you want to maintain time, then it, you have to maintain it as part of the global standards. And then there are something else you have to do to the atomic clock, not only technologically, but and I will go into those things later during my talk. So then the instrument called time or time and frequency standards. Okay. Otherwise, the atomic clock is a very precise, accurate sensor which can sense many things. Okay. So let me just begin with uh, today's. Okay, no, basically, before I begin with today's lecture, let me give a very brief about, uh, I think you should know these things. And I think during your BSc or MSc levels, even the first, I think the, even in 12th standard NCRT book, the first chapter starts with dimensions and units, right? So you have all, you know all these things, but just one or two slides I will spend. So there are seven base units or fundamental units. And these are all internal, they have all international standards. That's why it's called SI. SI is International <coughs> Standard of Units. And these seven base units are, can anyone say? Okay, it's written here. So it's like kilogram, mass, length, that unit is meter, time, unit is second, current, that is unit is ampere, uh, temperature, that is uh, Kelvin. Uh, substance of amount that is mole and what is CD? Candle, luminescence. Okay. And in today's day, all these units, all these fundamental units are connected to some fundamental constants. And these are how it's written. Like, for example, kilogram is measured or it's connected to Planck's constant. Similarly, Time or second is connected to delta nu. Delta nu in today's date it's connected to what is delta nu? Any idea? Nu is frequency. Yeah, so delta nu is the cesium frequency. Uh, it's not cesium frequency. The ground state of cesium, cesium is split into two states. So two substates. It's doubly split states. And the energy difference between these two doubly split states is delta nu, which is 9.193667. Uh, 190, something like that, arch. Okay, so that's the definition of second. I'll come to all these things. So, now, this atomic clock, I am only interested today about this atomic clock thing. As I already told you, one of the application is to maintain, to, to measure this time or second very, very accurately. But that's only one application. So, okay, this is... Uh, so this, this basically says for all these seven units, what are the fractional accuracy that the as per the international standards it's being maintained? Do you understand what is fractional accuracy? For example, it's a mass. If you have a one kilogram mass, what is the inaccuracy of that one kilogram? Let's say that is delta m. So if you write delta m by m, m is one kilogram, then this is for fractional accuracy. For example, uh, in time, it is delta nu by nu. Nu is the transition frequency of the cesium transition. Let's say delta nu is how accurately you measure that frequency. Nothing can be measured as 
absolutely accurate without any inaccuracy, right? You want to, I mean, I hope you agree that nothing real has to be always an inaccuracy even to do any measure, any, any sophisticated. So that's the quantity called fractional accuracy. And you see this. Numbers 10 to the power minus 18, 10 to the power minus 17, these are these numbers for the fractional accuracy. Now, among all these seven units, and these are the numbers which internationally achieved at the best level. And among them, which one is the best? It's in front of you, you can. Yeah, which? Time, right? It's 10 to the power minus 18. It's like several orders of magnitude better compared to any of them. Right? So, what we learn that time is maintained, or basically, see, nothing, no device measures time directly. It only measures the frequency. And inverse of the frequency is time. So, it's practically frequency. So, frequency is some quantity which can be measured most accurately in the world. That's something fundamental quantity which one can measure most accurately in the world compared to any of these things. Right? So, uh, okay, and well, just one more thing before I go into my topic. So, for example, what are the different systems which are being used to measure these different, all these several quantities uh, most accurately? For time, this is the most accurate clock, let's say, is based on optical clock, but the international definition is not based on optical standards at this moment, it's based on microwave standards. But optical clocks actually can do it much better. Why then it is not based on optical clock, even if, even if we know that optical clock can measure time or frequency much more accurately? Because there are some international protocols. If you want to change from one system to the other system, there are some protocols internationally you want to follow. And a very basic one is, it's not only two or three countries in the world should have this kind of system, but there has to be a critical number of countries who should be capable to have the build this kind of system. Then only we can say it's an international standard. Let's say, I mean, only US and Germany or Japan, these are the three countries have this system, the rest of the country doesn't have this. Then it doesn't make any sense that to make it an international standard. This is a so complex instrument and effect. So I'll come to all this complexity and all this. So this transition probably should happen in 2032 or something, it's expected. But at some point, this definition will change from microwave clock to the optical. Okay, so this is uh, like amount of substance that is based on the silicon sphere. This is a silicon sphere, and in that sphere, it's just a ball of this size and within that ball the number of silicon atoms is exactly counted so you know like it's like x x y y y z z z this many some uh, like number which is exactly counted on that sphere now you know what is silicon mass so you can say okay this is my one mole or something like that yeah this is based on silicon sphere uh, mass is based on Kegel balance. This definition was changed just a couple of years back. Previously, what we had on mass standards, it was, anybody know? It was just in one kilogram weight. Like, we know, we use this weighing machines and then weight. So that was made on platinum iridium alloy. And there are several copies of that platinum iridium alloy. And why this platinum iridium? I mean, I'm not going to that detail because this has like really uh, less corrosive things and so on and so on. So it was based on one kilogram, like physical mass of one kilogram made, made of platinum medium. And several copies were there in India. Uh, we have one of the copy which is internationally measured and time to time you have to calibrate this and so on and so on. Okay, but now two years back or three years back, I guess, it was changed, it's changed based on cable balance. So now this thing actually uses three different standards. It uses time standard, it uses uh, Josephson Junction, and it uses one more. That is, I think, current standard. So, uh, yeah, something like that. So it uses three standards, and it's all very, very complex experiment. And uh, uh, now the mass 
Based the mass definition of mass is based on that instrument, which is called Kibble. The luminescence of, luminescence of light is based on single photon source and single photon detector. So you know you have a single photon, and then you know what is the luminescence, and that's the definition of that. The temperature is based on a black body radiation cells like nearly identical or pure black body radiation sphere and etc. Length is based on optical frequency comb. Uh, previously it was based on a physical meter like one meter scale. Uh, made again they are made on platinum iridium alloy etc. But now it is changed on optical frequency comb. <coughs> uh, electric current is based on Joseph and Jackson. Anybody knows Joseph and Jackson? It's basically a semiconductor junction. And if you make these junctions, the voltage difference between these two is a PN junction kind of thing. So the voltage difference is exact. And now, if you make one million, I mean, it's something like, let's say, one millivolt. I don't know exactly how much it is per Joseph and junction. But then if you have one, milli, one million of these junctions, then it becomes one volt. It adds up. So uh, the voltage in hand then the current is measured with respect, sorry, the resistance is measured with respect to quantum Hall resistance technique very accurately. And then voltage divided by uh, resistance, you can get a current uh, standard. Okay, so these are the three, like seven very, very sophisticated experiments. Uh, few people in the world can do all these kind of things. And the international standard is based on these things. Now I am coming to the topic of my lecture, and that is introduction to the atomic clocks. And this actually what I already started with, that this is a precision sensor. That's why we name it atomic clock, name of the instrument. Otherwise, if it is a if it is for time and frequency metrology, then it would be what? Standard. So the standard has to come if you want to use it for the metrology time standard purpose. Otherwise, this is just a sensor which can sense many things. So today what I will cover, I will cover the very basic principles of the clocks and basic principle of the clocks are same. In, it, it's irrespective of whether it is optical clock, microwave clock or crystal oscillator clock, anything. It's basically the same, I will discuss that. Then I will discuss room temperature microwave clocks and go to even better clocks which uses ultra cold atoms, laser cooling and trapping techniques and etc. So I will try to describe as much as possible. Okay. So, okay. There is a video, I don't know why it's not working. So, yeah, so let's say there is a pendulum which oscillates, oscillates, uh, has some time period, which is T, which could be one second, which could be half a second, or anything else. Now, how do you define time with respect to that pendulum? I'm saying time, not one second. I will just count some number of oscillations and if I know the time period, I have to multiply this number of oscillations with the time period. If I know the time period, let's say it's half a second. So if I have 20 oscillations, then 20 times half a second, I will know, okay, I have 20 counts of oscillations, so this is this time, okay? Now let's say the oscillation period is one second. That means you can say, okay, one complete oscillation I have to count and that corresponds to one second. And that is the basic principle of any clocks. So any clock needs two things. One is an oscillator, which gives you the oscillations, very periodic oscillations, and a counter, which can count this number of oscillations very, very accurately. So this picture is basically, I mean, it is, it, it, this is basically a part of pendulum clock. You know, the early days, I don't know if you have seen that, this, like, this pendulum which was hanging on our walls of the houses. Maybe nowadays you don't see it. So the back end, it has this kind of wheels. It was kind and this is a mechanical. I'm not talking about the fancy crystal oscillator based clocks that we have today. I mean, I'm talking about very early days mechanical things which used to make like down, 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 sounds every hour, etc. 
So this is a pendulum which oscillates and, and the back it is connected to this wheel and these wheels have teeth. Okay. And these wheels are then connected to this thing which is called a fulcrum. Okay. So when this oscillates, this fulcrum makes the wheel to no, actually, it's other way around. This wheel used to rotate. You know, there was some early mechanical things. There was a key which you have to rotate, and then it runs for some time. So that thing gives a rotation to this wheel, and then the wheel rotates. And then, in every every one rotation, this fulcrum will count one teeth will just increase, and that was a counter. So the wheel is a oscillator. And this fulcrum is a device which counts. And that's how it was, it was working. So to make a very stable, very accurate clock, what do we need to have? We have to have an oscillator which is very stable. So your its oscillation periods should be constant. It should not change in every oscillation or something, something. And we need to have a very reliable counter so that it doesn't miss any count. Let's say this pendulum has an oscillation period of one second. In case this counter misses just one count, then it will give you one second inaccuracy. And that's why this early days clock, you know, every day, it used to get slow a little bit because these counters are not really, really precise and accurate and so. Okay. And then once you have these two things, then this gives the multiplication, like count times uh, that. Uh, oscillation, number of oscillations, period, and then it is basically what we see in the display on in front of us. But in the back end, that's what happens. And then the point is, you can choose different type of uh, oscillators and different type of counters. So the technology has got advanced and etc. And where, where for an atomic clock, the atoms are used as an oscillator. And the counters are basically something based on a microwave counter if it is a microwave clock and something based on optics if it is an optical clock. So instead of this mechanical uh, wheel and fulcrum thing, we have gone to that far that we have a most precise oscillators, which is atoms, and most reliable and accurate counter, which is based on different things, depends on which we are counting. So, any idea why atoms are better oscillators compared to anything else? Just use your general knowledge. See, because atom is an atom, if you take an hydrogen atom here and if you take a hydrogen atom in uh, moon, they are identical. But if you make, if you are talking about wheels, they can never be identical. There will be always a difference. So, naturally, atoms are identical. There is no difference. So that means the property of the atoms, if you take here in the moon or in US or in Japan, America, anywhere, they have the identical properties. But that cannot be true for a wheel or even for a crystal. A crystal is like a quartz crystal, right? And the quartz crystals, these are never ideal, like ideal crystals. There are always some impurities and etc. etc. And depends on like crystal to crystal, there will be always some difference. Yeah. So that's the reason atomic clocks are the most accurate clocks because it's just identical and that can be used as a standard and so on. Okay, now there is another thing which you have to understand like here, I have introduced two things. One is called stable, stability let's say, and second thing is accuracy. So anyone I mean, knows that what are the difference between these two things. Let me just explain. So let me explain pictorially. Let's say you have a bow and an arrow, and you have, let's say, 10 arrows, and you are throwing them on a, uh, you are targeting them on a, these things. What is it called? These this wheel things where you have marked the center and the periphery of them. So if you are very good, then you can end up to such a situation, like all your arrows are going at the centers. But this could be these situations, it could be these situations, it could be these situations. Now, out of these, which one is stable, which one is accurate, and which one is stable and accurate? If you plot this data, so these are the values 
of these different measurements and this is time. Like time means you are just showing one after other. So for this case, the situation is like that. For this case, situation is like this case situation is like that, and this uh, light line is basically your true value. What you ideally what it should be. And in this case, this is like that. So what is the difference in, in all these three cases? Your mean value is falling on top of the true value. Yeah, what you expect. Only in this case, it's away from the mean value. So obviously, this is accurate and stable. Right? No, oh, sorry. Ah, so this measurement is accurate and stable. This measurement is, of course, inaccurate. And this measurement is neither accurate nor stable. And this measurement is not accurate but stable. So you have done experiments in your lab, lab things. So what is your expectation that what what is the I mean where do you end up all this in which of these conditions? So you want to end up to these conditions, but do you end up to this condition? So then which one do you end up? Assume that you have done everything correct and everything uh, proper. Which one? Second. No. It's not possible. Fourth. No, accurate value, let's say it's no. There is a definition of SI definition and the accurate value is defined. But still, you will never be able to match to that value experimentally. There will be always some discrepancy. And this discrepancy is basically systematic uncertainty. You always, do you know what is systematic and you know statistical accuracy, right? Like you take mean measurements, you take mean deviation and mean value, then it's like these things and so on. But then there is another thing which is called systematics. And the systematic is, for example, let's say, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, let me, I am measuring the temperature of this room. I have a thermometer, which is quite good, nice, and everything. But the thermometer, what this thermometer is reading on uh, 23 degrees centigrade, this itself has some accuracy, inaccuracy. So what it is reading 23 degrees centigrade may be slightly deviated or not maybe, it's always slightly deviated, maybe the slightly amount is very small, but still there is always a deviation from its true value, which is defined by international standard unit. And this kind of machine inaccuracy or human introduced inaccuracy is called systematic inaccuracy, which generally we do not consider up to your level. But if you want to do something precise measurement, you have to consider that. And that's why you always end up to that situation that you have done measurements very nicely. You have taken care of everything, but your measured value is always slightly away or from the true value. And that you have to find out if you want to do really, really. And that is basically the difference when you want to use a machine as a standard and when you want to measure a machine as a some, some experiment. So for a standard, you have to know that how far are you away from the true value, okay? So for example, I was telling about this clock and the time and frequency standard. I can use a clock as a sensor. There I have to compare two different clocks, etc. So this situation is not that bad. Without identifying how far I am away from the true value, that should work. But if I want to use it as a standard, then I have to know that what is, I mean, how far is my measurement away from the true value? That is the most important thing in that case. So that's the difference between when you want to use a machine as a standard, when you want to use a machine as a sensor or something else. Okay. Now, a little bit of history, you, all of you know these things, like basically in ancient days, there was also clock available and that was for measuring time and etc. What was the reason that they need clocks, I mean, let's say thousands years back? Any idea? Because they wanted to, there were monks and etc. and they wanted to make prayer at a particular time depending on the position of moon and star and etc. Et depending on different religions and etc. And they want to know 
that when should I do this prayer? Okay, so due to that reason actually, the thought process started, what can we do to identify that at what time I have to do the prayer and this sundials, there are many like things, sundials, uh, sand clocks, water clocks, etc, etc, where all like at that time were infected water, one after other in different countries and etc. And in our ancient uh, times, in uh, Harappa Mahindadaro civilizations, they invented water clocks. If you have seen the movie, this Mahindadaro, and have you seen, anyone have seen that? No. Okay, so there actually they saw this thing, like you have a big ball of, full of water, and then you have a small ball, which has a small hole at the middle, and they were putting that small bowl without any water on top of this big bath of water. And at some point, this water will come inside this small bowl, and at some point, it will sink. And that was a measurement of time. If you take different size of bowls with different bowl size, etc., then you can practically divide this time. Okay, this is my, at that time, there was no second or something, but whatever the unit it was. And like Chinese use this, uh, Chinese civilization, they use this kind of uh, candles with marks, etc. So it can burn up to certain point, etc. And from there, today, what we have is like real anatomy. So that's like sort of uh, thing what we have done. And actually, Indian history about clock is extremely rich. It's very, very rich. And maybe you have, some of you have seen this thing. This is Jantar Mantar. There are five Jantar Mantars in the entire country. Okay? One is in Jaipur, that is the biggest one. Other one is in Delhi, and then there are a few more in Ujjain and so on and so on. I also forgot why. So several hundreds of years ago, I mean, Indian astronomy is actually very good, frankly speaking. And this all comes from the astronomy things. So we have a very rich history of like making clocks and astronomical uh, instruments. And in early days, you know, these were the units of time. One cost, Kal, Kal, I think we heard of Kal, like this. It's a Muhurta, the Muhurta is a very common word even today, like we want to find good Muhurta to get married or whatever, something, something. Ahuratra, Masa, and all are connected to actually present, uh, present days uh, units. For example, like one Ahuratra is 30 Muhurat is equals to one. You don't need to write that, this is just for your information, etc. So, yeah. So the, the timekeeping, actually one of these uh, things, let me just discuss briefly, that is, this is, this is, do you know what it is? This is quartz crystal. And whatever watch you are using, I don't have one, this actually has nowadays, all, all these watches have quartz crystal. They are not mechanical anymore. How it works, this quartz, quartz crystal has a piezoelectric property. What is piezoelectric property that you have probably read. What happens? If you apply some voltage, the length of the crystal, dimension of the crystal changes to, towards the direction of the where you apply the voltage. Okay? Now, if you make an AC voltage, if you apply an AC voltage, that means this dimension will ex expand and contract and that becomes as an oscillator. Right? And that is used basically in your, in all of our wristwatches. So the circuit is something like that. You have an LCR circuit, and then you have a capacitor inside the capacitor. It's not a capacitor, it's basically this crystal. So inside this capacitor, there is this crystal where you apply the voltage, and you, you, you match uh, the resonant frequency of this crystal oscillator with the other LCR things. We make a resonant circuit, basically, and you measure what is this frequency. Okay, and that's basically what is inside of all, all, all our, let's say, cheap wristwatches. Well, cheap means it may, no, may not be that cheap. Okay. Now, if I plot, so this is a plot, this is sort of 700 years. And this axis, it says, if a clock runs for some X amount of time, what should be that X amount when this clock will give one second inaccuracy? For example, for an optical clock, it's 300 million years, sort of. Okay. So, what should be the duration of the clock so that it runs and it gives one second inaccuracy over that time? 
So you see, like early mechanical clock, which I explained a few minutes back, or pendulum clocks, or well, like similar, very similar, not too much different. So this, let's say pendulum clock. So this is in its unit of year, okay? Pendulum clock, which was inaccurate to one second for 0 0.01 year. It's like few days, right? Okay. Whereas from there, see the quartz clock, which we just discussed, it's like several, uh, like, uh, let's say on the order of 10 year time scale or etc., which will give one second inaccuracy, which is very good, like for our regular purpose. If it is one second inaccurate in 20 years, who cares? About in 20 years, the year will show uh, that, that uh, uh, works most likely. And from there, we have gone to this far today. We don't have the nuclear clock yet, that is under research at this moment, but the optical clock, which exists in the, uh, in the world, and that is inaccurate to one second over 300 billion years. Okay. So now coming to the atomic clock. So this atomic clock, what is, what is the purpose of atomic clock, etc. that I sort of already discussed. So during the Second World War, it was noticed that people need a very accurate clock than they have at that time. Why is this the case? Because during the Second World War, many sophisticated war related technology came. Right, like let's say bombing and etc. to a particular points and etc. And then to decide that particular point, it depends on how accurately you can detect time or synchronize time. So then, the, so basically, the thought came from there: we need a better clock than what was there at that time. And then, in 1944, have you heard the name of Rabi? Isodor I Rabi. Rabi frequency, Rabi's oscillation. So Rabi is the, let's say, godfather of uh, like present atomic physics. Yeah. So Rabi got this Nobel Prize in 1944, and uh, the World War was during 1945 and so on. You know, the Yosuma Nagasaki happens in 1945. So he was a Nobel laureate at that time and uh, he gave the idea that radio frequencies derived from an atom would actually work as a much better oscillator than they have at that time. And so that's how the atomic clock concept and everything came. Okay, so this is a cutting from New York Times in 1945. So why atomic clocks are better? Because the oscillation frequency is extremely larger compared to any other oscillators they have at that time. So why that helps? Yeah, you say you are seems like you understood. Why larger oscillation frequency is better? It precise time. No, but that's the point. But why? Why? Why it gives you precise time? So the thing is, like, let's say if there is an oscillator which oscillates once in a second, and there is an oscillator which oscillates 10 to the power 15 times in a second. See, you can take whatever counter, there is always some inaccuracy with the counter, also. Nothing can be perfect. So, in case if you miss a count which has an oscillation of one second oscillation, that means your inaccuracy becomes one second immediately. However, if you miss one count for an oscillator which is oscillating 10 to the power 15 times per second, there if you miss one count, that means you are missing 10 to the power minus 15 second. So that's the whole point. If you take an oscillator which has a much larger oscillation frequency, you have a better chance to make a more accurate clock. Is that clear? Shall I repeat? Okay. So, yeah. So that, that is one of the uh, most important thing, most stable oscillator. That's what I already discussed, like clock and atoms you take here or in the moon or anywhere else. This is the most stable, most identical things you can, nature has created. It's not human created. Okay. So, yeah. 
So for the uh, talks with higher oscillation frequencies, uh, lower oscillation frequencies, uh, it'll also be uh, harder to miss an oscillation. Right? I will come to that. That's a very good question. So I think I have a slide on that. Yeah, I thought somebody would ask that. Thanks. Then the aging of that material. For example, if you take a quartz crystal, so due to moisture, due to everything, this, that thing, this quartz crystal's property will slowly change because this is a material, right? It will, its property will change. But an atom, whatever it was in the beginning of the universe, just for the exact beginning of the universe, there was no atom, but in few seconds from then, even after two days, everything is same, nothing has changed, doesn't age. Like a carbon atom you take from your body and you take from a fish's body, it's identical. Okay. So there is no aging, nothing. It's a more, most unperturbed system. Like for example, what, what do you mean by perturbation? What do I mean by perturbation? Any idea? Like if you put an atom in an electric field, will there be any perturbation? Anybody from that side? You guys, if you put an electric, if you put an atom in an electric field or a magnetic field, will there be any perturbation? Come on, have you guys learned the Riemann shift? Yeah? Good. You don't know about Riemann splitting? So, what is required to get a Riemann splitting? So, magnetic field. So, there, so then, okay, so then there is a perturbation or not? Yeah, so then speak out, please. You have learned all those things. So, the similarly in electric field, what it is? Yes. So there will be perturbation, but that perturbation is very, very tiny. First of all, it's very, very tiny compared to, let's say you put a crystal on an electric field because the crystal length will change. Every crystal has some piezoelectric property. Some crystal have larger piezoelectric property. That's why you call it piezoelectric materials and etc. But otherwise, every crystal has much more perturbation in electric magnetic field with temperature, like if you, uh, we know the length expansion contraction. So if you take any crystal or anything, not even crystal, any material, it will have some thermal expansion, thermal contraction in temperature, but in temperature nothing happens to an atom. Okay? So the perturbation is uh, it's very small and second most important thing is the change due to this perturbation one can measure very accurately. We know exactly how much will be this Riemann shift for a particular state, right? It's mj, g, mu, b, b. If you know the magnetic field amount, we know rest of this quantity, so we can estimate it extremely accurately what is this mj, g, mu, b, b. This is only first order. There are second order, higher order terms also. But it's accurately, one can estimate or one can measure. So, the expected measurement was here, and what you measured, this is here. So this difference is this kind of perturbation, which is, let's say, you do all these systematic effects. It's not necessarily it has to be, I'm taking the example of electric or magnetic field or temperature, it could be thousand other things. But this change, this difference, this shift, can be very accurately estimated for in case of an atom. But for crystal, you cannot, because the crystals are different. They have a different property. Third, the last thing is the atoms can be, there are like very sophisticated technology today where the atoms can be stored or kept in a very controlled manner so that you can even control the magnetic and electric field within that small volume. It is called like trapping and cooling. So you can cool the atom to nearly zero degree Kelvin temperature. Zero degree Kelvin temperature. That means the effect of temperature of the atom will be very Minimal. What is the effect of temperature on the atom? Uh, a temperature on an atom? Doppler shift. Okay? The larger the temperature, that means the atom will have a larger kinetic energy. And larger kinetic energy gives Doppler shift. But if you cool them to very uh, close to zero degree Kelvin, that means the atom won't have any energy left. So that means the Doppler shift will be very minimal. And 
it's like an atom of few atoms which can be stored in a volume the size, diameter of this volume is let's say 100 micrometer a tiny thing and within that tiny 100 micrometer you can practically control the electric magnetic field very very well you can know what is the magnetic and electric field so that is called cooling and trapping technique and that further helps to make us better and better clocks okay so, I mean, the way I am going, I think I will not be able to even finish students. I mean, okay, but we'll see. We may skip something at the end. Okay. So, this is the basic things for atom photon interactions. An atom has energy levels. I hope you know that. You guys know that, right? Energy levels, you have learned rotarian diagram like hydrogen atom. You, you, all of you have learned the hydrogen. So, similar things. Every atom has several energy levels. So let's take a very simple one which has two states, ground state and excited state. And this is the frequency difference between these two states which is omega zero. So if you excite an atom, say atom generally is in the ground state. If you excite that atom to an excited state there, you have to supply this frequency from some external source. Depending on whether it is an uh, what is this new zero? This is in microwave or in optical domain. I have to use a laser or a microwave frequency, but that's something else. And then it goes to the excited state, and atom will never stay there forever. Right? It will decay back from excited state to the ground state. And what is this decay called? Spontaneous emission. Right? It could be also stimulated, but that's a different thing. But even if you don't stimulate these things, it will never stay there. The excited state due to spontaneous emission, it will come back. So, there should be a scattering rate like in per second, this atom, how many times this atom can go back and forth? So, that means per second, how many photons it can scatter? And that is called scattering rate, gamma p. And that depends on this capital gamma. What is capital gamma? That is line width of that transition, which is inversely proportional to the Lifetime of the excited state. What is lifetime of the excited state? That is like how long this atom will take before spontaneously it falls back to the ground state. It will never stay there forever. Right? It will at some point come back and for a particular atom, for a particular energy state, this is a number which is nature has decides. And it is same for any such atoms for those transitions. So this is uh, like the line width of the state and S0 depends on the what power of the laser you use or laser is excited. It could be microwave also. So it's called saturation parameter. Delta is the timing. Like if you if your excite this exciter photon is not exactly at that frequency but slightly detuned, slightly, slightly away or slightly above from that frequency, still it will have a probability to scatter that photons. So that is something called detuning, which comes into the lecture. Gamma is line width of the transition, basically. So this gamma is same as this capital gamma with a difference in 2 pi. Okay. So the maximum scattering range would be gamma by 2, because this delta could be 0. And S0 could be very large so that you can ignore 1. So S0 becomes divided by S0 basically. So if S0 is much, much larger than 1 and detuning is 0, then S0, S0 goes, then it becomes gamma by 2. So that means maximum scattering rate would be line width of the transition divided by <coughs> 2. Now I, I am coming to the definition of second. So this is exactly this atom photon scattering phenomena is uh, the definition of the second is based on the atom photon scattering phenomena. So I already described these two level systems. Let's see you have an exciter to excite the atoms, it falls back. And then if you tune the frequency, if you tune the frequency of this exciter and measure the amplitude of the fluorescence, then you will get this kind of spectrum. What is the line shape of the spectrum? Huh? Sorry? I cannot hear. Huh? I 
can not hear. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay, let's go back. So, you see, there is a quantity called detuning. You understand detuning? Okay. You should speak louder if you don't understand. Otherwise, how do I understand? So, this is the frequency difference between the ground state and excited state. You have to supply that frequency or energy. H times frequency, H is Planck's constant, and frequency is the energy. So you have to supply that frequency externally. So that atom of that energy go to the excited state, right? To excite that thing. Now, <clears throat> what happens? So the I, so best case scenario would be you supply exactly that energy or exactly that frequency. But even this the external frequency is slightly away from that omega zero or slightly above from the omega zero, still it will have an absorption probability or excitation probability. And that is actually visible from this formula. There is a detuning here. So detuning is zero means there is the resonance frequency omega zero matches with your exciter frequency. So omega is your exciter frequency, omega zero, omega zero minus omega becomes zero, detuning is zero. But even there is a finite value of detuning, if it is a non-zero, still it will have certain probability to excite that atom. Okay. Now, this has a nice set. If you plot that thing, exactly you will get this spectrum. This is called Lorentzian spectrum. Okay. So, that's what it says. Like, when your excited frequency sits here, then you have the maximum probability. Your detuning becomes zero and that comes into the denominator. But even it is non-zero, it has certain probability and you get this kind of line shape. And if the tuning is very, very large, then the probability just goes down. Yeah, to nearly to zero value or identically, ideally in infinite, that goes to zero. So practically what I am saying that if you, have, if you can make such a system, an exciter system with an atomic system connected together and you have a capability to measure the <coughs> fluorescence rate while you are tuning the frequency or detuning, then you basically measure this kind of spectrum and then you know the centroid of that Lorentzian spectrum is your atomic transition frequency, right? So you have an exciter where frequency is unknown, but with an atom photon interaction, this kind of system, if you measure this spectrum, then you know, you basically calibrate your excited frequency with respect to atomic system. That is the right way to say that. The atomic system has an identical frequency difference. So you are calibrating your excited frequency with respect to atomic system by, by measuring this kind of spectrum. And then this becomes a definition of frequency or inverse of that is second. Okay. Now, there are different systems, as I already discussed, quartz, hydrogen measure, I have not discussed, but you know hydrogen measure is basically 1s to 2s transistor at, uh, uh, what is it, 14 point something gigahertz, etc. Uh, then rubidium clocks, cesium clocks, cesium fountain clocks, I will come to these things. <coughs> these are western microwave, and then optical clock, and these are the different new zero values. This value of new zero and new zero decides whether it is in optical domain or it is microwave domain. For example, in cesium based system, which is the definition of our present second, this is 19192631770 hertz, or roughly speaking, 9.2 gigahertz. Okay, whereas in optical domain, it is on the order of 10 to the power 14 to 10 to the power 15 hertz. So this is 10 to the power 9. Or 10 to the power 10, let's say roughly. And this is 10 to the power 14 to 15, like five orders of magnitude higher in frequency. And why higher in frequency is good? I described. Okay? So that's why if you go to higher and higher frequency, you have a better chance to make a bit, uh, more accurate clocks. And that's how optical clock is much better compared to microwave clocks, like cesium clocks. Okay, now coming back to the definition of one second. Why cesium? Why not something else? Because cesium has one isotope which is non-radioactive, absolutely non-radioactive. 
and this is cesium one one thirty three. Okay, so <clears throat> no isotope selectivity is needed because it has only one isotope, which is a non radioactive. <clears throat> the second thing is it has like the ground state of cesium, which is is half state. It is further split into two sub levels due to its nuclear spin. You have learned DJ coupling and all these LS couplings and etc. Okay, so the total angular momentum, electron angular momentum, couples with nuclear angular momentum, nuclear spin, and then uh, so <coughs> electron spin it has one valence electron. The cesium has one valence electron in the outer cell. So that means the electron spin is half, and the nuclear spin is seven half. So how these two things can couple? These are two vectors. Anyone? This would be yeah. Plus J one plus J two more. There is no J two. Okay, but, but let's say yeah. Um, yes, one is yes. But what is this plus and minus means? And vector sum. And what does that mean? So, like, let's say your nuclear spin is in this direction, upward, and the electron spin could be upward in the same direction, like nuclear spin, or could be the opposite direction. So that's what this plus and minus means. So seven of plus half is four, and seven of minus half is three. So that's why this electronic state, after coupling with this nuclear state, which is this, this coupling is called what? No, the less coupling is gamma no, wave. Sorry, total, total moment. No, no, this has a name. Hyperfine interaction. You guys are MSc or BSc? Huh? BSc. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, due to this hyperfine interaction or electron to nuclear coupling, this state is further split into two states, which is and the splitting is 9192631770 hertz. This splitting, this is explanation. And these are the reasons why the definition of present definition of microwave block, microwave atomic block is based on cesium. The okay. Now, this microwave block can be divided into, are, are basically there are two types. One is at room temperature operations, which operates at room temperature 300 degree Kelvin. And further, these cesium atoms can be laser cooled nearly 0 degree Kelvin temperature and trap. Then it is called cesium fountain. It's the same cesium, but just introducing laser cooling technique and trapping techniques, it further can be more accurate and uh, this is another type of flow, which is called atomic fountain flow. So I will try to explain the principle of these two things. <clears throat> so let's first start with this room temperature cesium atomic flow. Okay, they operate at room temperature. They are neither laser, they are not cooled to any millikelvin temperature, or neither, nor they are trapped. So what happens there? You take an atomic oven, which means there is an enclosure and it has a very small hole in one side of it and the cesium atoms inside of that uh, inside of that reservoir it can be in f is equal to 3 state or f is equal to 4 state what is f these are the two states which i just explained to you f is equal to 3 and 4 so these two states can be considered as two different magnets which are oriented in two different directions because of the electron spin is either along this direction or in this direction. So that's why I have drawn little magnets so that you can visualize it a little bit clearer. So the magnets are the same uh, magnitude, but the orientation is different. That's the only difference. So, but in, inside this path or reservoir, <coughs> we have a 50-50 chance to find the cesium atoms in two different states. 50% will be in F is equal to 3, 50% will be in F is equal to 4. So first thing what I have to, like I have to hit this oven little bit so that these atoms get little more energy and they have only one way to come out, that is that small hole. So they will all come out through that hole and this is called atomic beam. 
So we have to create atomic beam in this one. This is the atomic beam. And then we use magnetic field gradient. Why? Have you, I think you have learned starting our limits, right? In starting our experiment, what happens? If you apply a magnetic field gradient, then we split it into two different parts because of the interaction. So this is like this standard like experiment, this standard like setup is practically purifying these two type of magnets in two different directions. Then one just goes out of your experiment, you throw them away, and the other one, which is at f is equals to three, you take them further for your experiment. You take them further so that they interact with the microwave. I told you about the atom photon interaction. Here the photons are in microwave region, right? So you have to pass them through your exciter, which excites these magnets in the microwave at 9.192 photos. So, so this is the microwave cavity, they enter to the microwave cavity, and if you don't do anything, there is a second stage of magnetic field, then it will just pass through. Because you don't excite them, you have not excited them. But now if you have excited them and if your frequency is right, then these atoms will from F is equals to 3 will be excited to F is equals to 4 state. If the it has right frequency and so on, right? Now if it goes to F is equals to 4 state, these will basically then again deflect these atoms. Because they have gone to F is equals to 4 state. And then if you keep a detector in such a way so that when it deflects, it just fall onto your detector, you will get a signal, right? Now, if you scan the frequency of the microwave across this ide uh, uh, ideal frequency, then your signal le level will go up and down. At some point, it will get the maximum amplitude of the signal. And if you are slightly away from that resonant frequency, the signal level will go down, that Lorentzian shape and so on. So that way, you have to servo these things. Servo means giving a feedback. And lock this microwave source to that frequency where your signal level is maximum. Right? That is your transition frequency. You decide where my signal level is maximum. And I will lock the uh, microwave frequency at that particular frequency so that my signal level stays at maximum. And that way, I am calibrating my microwave frequency with respect to cesium atoms transition frequency. I know that my microwave frequency which I have generated is at 919261770 hertz because I am getting maximum signal. So then, this microwave frequency becomes a frequency standard, right? Okay. The wire is the uh, no, um, uh, yes, you are right. It will it will add some systematics, but for this kind of clocks, this accuracy due to this heating of the atom or atoms is much smaller compared to what we get here. So, for example, in these clocks, the accuracy on your fractional accuracy is 10 to the power minus 14 range. Okay. What is the 10 to the, 10 to the power minus 14 range means? That means delta nu by nu is equals to 10 to the power 14. And nu is 9 point whatever hertz, let's say roughly speaking 10 gigahertz. 9.2 gigahertz is roughly 10 gigahertz. So 10 to the power 14 divided by 10 to the power 10. So that means you, your delta nu is 10 to the power minus 3. Right? So that means millihertz. So the temperature dependence shift is much smaller than the millihertz level. So it doesn't matter. <clears throat> and that is exactly the point. If you want to do much better than that, you have to go to uh, ultra cold samples or cold samples. And I'll come. I'll come. Okay, so this is basically how it looks like. This is called a tube. This is a glass tube. And this entire thing is kept inside of that glass tube. And this is in NRC Canada. And this tube could be very long. And this is, for example, I have seen that thing. This is almost as long as this length. And it could be also very small, compact. So earlier when people were, I'm not going into those details because it will take even further time. People started, sorry, making this kind of very long tubes and etc. But nowadays it can, I mean, it's also actually pretty old. 
is they are from 1955. It's a very uh, like uh, like several almost 50, 60 years old, 70 years old technology. So it, you, you can get it in a very small package, which is like size of a let's say computer CPU or something like that. And this is called commercial cesium plus, which operates at room temperature. And sort of accuracy of this is fractional accuracy is 10 to the power minus 14 right? Okay. I have another 10 minutes, but let's say, let me see how, how far can I get. The second thing is what you was asking that the temperature dependent system ethics and etc. So further, it can be improved by cooling these cesium atoms to lower temperature. So actually, I was cheating with you a little bit when I discussed, when I said that you just apply, this is a microwave thing, it's, no, it's not only a microwave generator, but it's a cavity, and there are two places where atom interacts with these two things. This is interaction zone one, this is this one, and this is interaction zone two. Okay, I will come to that why it is the case, because we want to use the effect of interference. Please keep it in mind, I will explain it in a few minutes. So, so, this is the same thing, this is the microwave cavity and this is the first interaction zone and this is the second interaction zone of the microwave cavity. And if you use this normal room temperature cesium, then the sort of line with what you measure is hundreds of hertz. you cannot do better than that. How can you improve that? So we know the uncertainty principle, delta T times delta E, E is time, E is energy, has to be greater than H bar by 2. Now this delta E can be further written as H times delta F, F is the frequency, is equal to H by 2 times delta T, delta T goes here, and H goes away, then I can write delta F by F0, F0 is my resonant frequency, then is equals to 1 by F0 times delta T. Okay, so this is my fractional accuracy. This is the definition of my fractional accuracy. This is inversely proportional to delta T. And what is delta T here? Yeah, what is time? Yeah. So the delta T is the travel time from cavity 1 to cavity 2. Okay, I have one interaction zone here, one interaction zone here. The atoms are coming from this side. So first it interacts with this one. It goes through this path and then it interacts with this one. The travel time that atom goes from here to here, that is delta T. So that means since it comes to the denominator, if you somehow increase delta T, your fractional accuracy will be better. Right? Agreed? Agreed? How can you increase delta T? Exactly, that is pedestrian way, and that was the reason why people are building these so long atomic clocks. It's like several tens of meter long, so that they wanted to increase this delta T. That was pedestrian way. But what else can you do? What sophistication, sophistication can you do? Huh? Sorry, I cannot hear. Can you repeat louder? Don't worry, just speak. Deflection? No, not really. See, the delta T is what? The separation between these two cavities, which is let's say L, divided by velocity of the atoms. You are saying I can increase L. Decrease velocity. So how can you do that? By cooling. See, the atoms have some certain kinetic energy, that means it is traveling at a certain speed. If you can reduce its kinetic energy, that means if you pull them, you can in <coughs> decrease V, so that means you can increase T. And that is exactly the principle of, I mean, the application of laser cooling. By using the laser cooling, I will come to the laser cooling, but I don't, I mean, I don't have enough time. So, by this laser cooling technique, you basically decrease the velocity of the atom so that you can increase the delta T and that way you can increase the uh, accuracy delta F by F0. Okay. So, this is a Maxwell's Boltzmann distribution of an atomic uh, atoms in and coming in an atomic beam. 
you know all Maxwell's goals by distribution, right? In a normal atomic. Now, if you apply the cooling technique, laser cooling technique, then you can actually create a lot of atoms at the lower velocity, which is an abnormal thing, which is different than in Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And then these atoms can be used in your clock, which has a much smaller velocity, so that it increases the density and increases the accuracy. Okay? And this is why you have my own during my PhD time uh, data I was taking. Okay. Uh, okay, this is like I should probably stop here because otherwise we will take another 10 minutes. So, the, what is the tem temperature here? It's, it's an ensemble temperature. Here, the temperature is related to the kinetic energy of the atoms, right? It's not the temperature of this room, it's Right, temperature of the ensemble of atom, which is related to the kinetic energy of the atom. So the kinetic energy is Ek, and we know per degree of freedom it's half kBt. kB is Boltzmann constant. So if you have a 3 degree of freedom, 3 by 2 kBt. So each atom has 3 by 2 kBt. If you have n atoms, it's n times 3, 3 by 2 kBt. That's the temperature what we are talking about here. And that is what we have to reduce by laser cooling techniques, and that is called. Uh, sorry, that, that, that is the temperature what we have to do. Now, I have to, so this maybe I will just start tomorrow. Otherwise, uh, it, it won't complete, and then it will be somewhere in me. So, tomorrow we'll start with how to reduce the temperature of the atoms by laser cooling. So, practically, I will discuss about laser cooling and magnetic temperature. Yeah. Okay. So, any questions so far? Feel free to ask. Don't be shy. If I cannot answer, I will come. Yeah. Sorry, there's a question on Zoom. Uh, okay. So maybe first I can take his uh, and come back. Sure, sure. What is Sarbo locking? What is Sarbo locking? Oh, Sarbo locking is basically feedback. Like you measure, you have some true value, and you measure how much your how much your measured value is deviating from the true value. You measure and correct it. So that it stays in this thing. So this, you need some electronics to do that thing, and that technique is called Sarvola. It's a feedback thing. You measure, give the feedback to some electronics, and keep it there. Yeah, the Zoom questions, how can I find it? Uh, no, they are raising their hand. I'll ask them to unmute. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Hello, sir. Yeah, so. Uh, so I have a question about that atom excitation. Uh, can you just go to the slide of excitation? Uh, no, so I'll, next one. Yeah, uh, so the question was uh, uh, like, well, we have an excitation of the atoms. So it will go from the lower state of energy to the higher state of energy. And it stays at about a certain amount of time, and then it comes back to the lower state of energy. Yes. So the measurement of time is dependent on that uh, delta t of no, 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 no. Uh, I had a doubt about that because yeah, no, 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 no. Measurement of time is based on the frequency of the transition. That is this new zero. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, I'll only receive the photon when it comes back to the lower state, right, sir? Right. So for the detector to detect. Yes. Uh, so, how will a detector measure that? You know, I know that it, it has a certain frequency, but uh, it only comes at that time. So, how is it really calculating so no, so the time? First, the thing, first thing is from your mind, erase this thing that the time measurement is related to the delta t uh, or tau of the excited cell. So, so, time measurement has nothing to do with this tau. Okay, erase that thing. And this tau is typically on the order of uh, uh, like uh, femtoseconds or picoseconds, picoseconds. So that means the detector count rate is much, much larger. That means one atom takes only, only stays there for some picosecond at that excited state and comes back. So in one second, it can be excited 10 to the power 12 times, roughly speaking. Okay, so that means every time if it produce one photon, you can get into the power 12 photons on your counter in one second. 
Okay. These are some typical numbers I am saying. Now, what I describe this excited frequency necessarily not necessarily has to be exactly at that frequency. If it is slightly away from new zero, it has certain probability to excite, and that was actually what was shown in the previous this uh, this mathematical formula. So this delta is the detuning. Detuning is how far away is your excited frequency from the absolute frequency. Okay, so as a result of that, even the excited frequency is not exactly at new zero. If you scan the frequency, you will get some sort of signal. So when it comes to exactly at new zero, you will get the maximum signal. And when you get the maximum signal, you call it the <coughs> frequency which matches to, to the resonant frequency of the atom. So you calibrate your frequency. That's how it works. And then, then once you know the frequency, inverse of that is time. Is that clear now? Okay, sir. Yeah. Sometimes we have only one single Okay. Uh, sir, just in continuation with the previous question, uh, yeah. Like we are doing the laser cooling for uh, increasing the delta T. Yes. Like we are increasing the length <clears throat> or we are doing the laser cooling. The another technique is to do the laser cooling to increase the delta T. Right. So this laser cooling will increase this tau also? No, 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 no. The tau is the atomic property. This tau is excited state lifetime. Nobody even God cannot do anything. Okay. If you take an atom from that was how, how I started, if you take an atom, this has precise properties, no one can change. Okay. So uh, okay. external what cooling has... and will not affect that tau. No, 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 not, not at all. Okay. Nothing will affect that tau. Okay. Okay, sir, thank you. Yeah. So what's the lifetime of this? That is different for different data. So you have learned selection rules. That's a very good question. So let's go. On. So you have learned the selection rules for transitions, right? What are those? Delta L is equals to or what? Yeah. So these selection rules are for some particular type of transitions. Which transitions are there? Electric dipole transitions. Okay. But there are several other transitions. How the electric dipole transition comes? From the multiple expansion. You have learned multiple expansion, right? In mathematical physics or so. These things are there in these levels also. Were a BSC student? So, they are, you have to, I mean, these things are 100% sure it is there. So, anyhow, for the multiple expansion, the first term is the electric dipole. Yeah, then there are electric water pole, octa pole, etc. etc. So the selection rules what you learn typically on your book, this is all for electric dipole transitions. But not necessarily the other transitions doesn't have any, it just have a very small probability. So now coming to your question, this tau, this tau is a property of a particular state. Every atom has several states. So each state will have different tau. If it is an electric dipole transition, then this tau is actually much smaller. Yeah, the excited state lifetime is much smaller. If it is an quadrupole, octopole, or any higher transition, this, this tau becomes larger and larger. Okay. So, for example, uh, yeah, so that's what it is. Like typically for an electric dipole transition, this tau is several nanoseconds, 5 to 10 nanoseconds, that corresponds to some tens of megahertz, inverse of tau, that is this gamma, for the previous slide. If there was a gamma which was 1 over tau, 9 unit of the transition. That is few tens of megahertz, which corresponds to few nanoseconds, if you put the number. But if you take an electric quadrupole transition, or optical transition, then this tau is years. So if an atom goes there in the excitement state, it will take several years to come back. Million years. That means this life excited, this natural life rate of the transition is very, very small. It's like nanohertz. 
So for making clocks, one has to use the, those kind of transition where the tau is very large, where because the natural line width of the transitions is very small. I will come to that in tomorrow's lecture, probably. That's why that is needed. But this tau, your question is like tau is completely different for different states, even for different atoms also. Any other? Yeah. Uh, sir, in the beginning, you said that we have clocks that have like one second per billion years. Yeah. Are we approaching a limit by the Heisenberg No, it's still further far from Heisenberg answer. For example, what is Heisenberg is 10 to the power minus 34, H is on the order of 10 to the power minus 34, and H is delta T times delta nu. Okay, now put these numbers and tomorrow they will be what delta nu will have to be. Okay, like let's say you put delta. Uh, T is 10 to the power minus 18, which is 1 second in 300 billion, roughly speaking. And then find out what is delta. Now you do it tomorrow. You, this is your homework uh, to be Okay. So it's far away from us. So it's technically limited. Any other questions? Okay, then if not, then. I think you have five minutes to take your break and take the coffee or something before the next lecture. Okay.